Hi everyone, happy Friday or Ureshi Kenyobi for those of you in Japan and thank you so much for watching. So how the hell did I end up starting a company in Japan without speaking the language? What was that like? When I moved from Kenya to Japan, a country I never even visited before with all my stuff, the last thing I thought I would do is start a company there. How did I end up starting a successful startup five years ago in a country where entrepreneurs really struggle? Well in this video, I will share with you how, with the help of this crazy guy, that I started a company called Next Frontier, which is a video production and digital marketing company based in Shibuya, Tokyo. This turned out to be probably the best decision I ever made in my life. Great, now before we jump into it, please don't forget to subscribe or smash that like button or bell to get notifications on my newest videos if you like the content. So how did I end up in Japan from Kenya? Well, the quick answer is I used to work for a niche Spanish advertising agency that specialized in country branding. I will live in an economy for six months to a year and a half, meet the leaders of the country, and make a 360 PR campaign around their words. So the concept was, this is what's happening through the eyes and the words of the leaders of the country. This is how, six years ago, I moved to Japan with all my stuff, having never set foot in the country before. But the journey wasn't that simple. My old company had never worked in Japan before. In fact, almost all of our projects were in emerging economies because they usually needed more help communicating what was good about their country compared to the usual headline dominating stories like crime, poverty, or natural disasters. For example, I did a project in Guyana. I even met and interviewed their president. Can you guess where Guyana is? Most people think it is in Africa, but that isn't correct. Actually, here is Guyana, a small Caribbean nation sandwiched between its two much bigger neighbors of Venezuela and Brazil. Did you also know that Guyana is the only English-speaking country in Latin America due to the fact that they were former or British colony? That it has beautiful ecotourism in the Amazon, including the highest single-drop waterfall in the world? These are the themes that we would communicate to global audiences. Anyway, I had to fight with my company for about six months to send me to Japan before they agreed. And it's a good thing they did because our project was extremely successful. And this was happening even though I would say our value proposition wasn't that great due to the fact that most of our activities were based on partnerships with leading print publications like USA Today, Newsweek, New York Times, or The Economist. I came to realize one of the main reasons our project was doing so well was that because in Japan, traditional advertising like print, billboards, flyers, and exhibitions were, and still are, quite strong and account for most of the annual expenditure in Japan. In 2015, when I started my company, digital marketing was only making up less than 20% of the overall expenditure. While today it has grown to 30%, this is still much less compared to other developed countries where internet advertising accounts for a majority of the advertising spent. So I thought, if we could create a more digital heavy services company, especially short dynamic videos, we could really help Japanese companies and grow our business quickly. So in a nutshell, essentially we help Japanese brands communicate with international mood and feel content. This is the main reason we started Next Frontier, and this still accounts for much of our business. But more and more, we are also making content for the Japanese market for global brands like the NBA, Budweiser, Goose Island, or Ferrari. In the beginning, we would often create content around the words of their CEO, which is what we called personality branding. Having the CEO being featured in marketing content is something that is fairly common in the West. Some of the biggest brands in the world, like Tesla with Elon Musk, Apple with Steve Jobs, or Virgin with Richard Bronson, leverage this perfectly. But in Japan, this was, and still is, not often used. So it was a new idea for many Japanese brands. Because we normally film the CEOs to create the content, our plan was to make the CEO feel like he was walking onto a Hollywood set. We would have a bunch of lights and multiple cameras, and we would have a makeup artist, and we would say things like, don't worry, sir, we're gonna make you look like Ken Watanabe. We brought most of our gear from a New York City film equipment mecca, BNH, and had one of my best friends from New York bring all the equipment to Tokyo. At the start, we were running the business out of my small studio apartment in Shibuya, every day having a few Japanese part-time workers come to my apartment and try to generate interest in our company and set up some introduction meetings. If this wasn't exciting enough, we also got threatened to be sued by The Economist within our first couple months. It kind of sounds bad when I say it like that, but actually it wasn't our fault. 
it was because of a communication gap between London, their headquarters, and the Tokyo office. The abridged backstory is that I approached the headquarters to run a campaign on The Economist to coincide with when Japan hosted the G7 summit. The concept was simple. Take advantage of this global event and tap into the heightened attention that would be on Japan when Barack Obama, David Cameron, and Angela Merkel were all in Japan for the G7 to communicate various current economic trends while promoting Japanese leading brands, such as Japan Airlines. London was excited about the idea and agreed on terms, so my company could start contacting Japanese companies to be included in the campaign. The problem was that London failed to mention this arrangement to the Tokyo office, so true to Japanese form, when we started contacting companies, they contacted the Economist Tokyo office to double check whether what we were offering them was legit or not. The Tokyo office though hadn't been told about our project, and in fact they had their own plans to capitalize on the G7 being hosted in Japan. So let's say they weren't so excited to hear about our initiative and sent a rather strong message communicating this. In the end, we pulled it off, but it was much smaller than originally planned due to this miscommunication, as we were limited in the number of companies we were allowed to include. This wasn't the only exciting event of the first year, it was just non-stop hustle. There was also a memorable moment with another agency who was not too happy with our early success, where I had to restrain Thomas from jumping over the table to get his point across. Also, when my apartment became too small for salespeople plus equipment and crew, we ran the business out of a bunch of different Airbnbs because at the time, Thomas had three or four apartments for this purpose, but it always depended on availability. So a few times we had staff going to Airbnbs where tourists were sleeping. Also, in order to make more phone calls, we always had to spread out in each apartment, making phone calls on the porch in the middle of Japan's scorching hot summer. Thomas was even calling in the toilet sometimes. Quick side note, little known fact that in Japan, most apartments and homes have separate toilets and bathrooms for cleanliness purposes. Over here, we have the shower slash bath. We learned a lot in those first couple years, reinvented the business several times along the way, and this is probably one of the biggest pieces of advice I can give people who are starting a company in Japan or really anywhere. Listen to the market and be flexible. How you do things today will completely change, maybe five or 10 times over the year, due to responding to the market. One example of this is that in the beginning, all of our promotional content about our company was essentially why they should choose us. Why were we different from other Japanese content creation companies? But the mistake we made was that in many cases, Japanese companies still weren't fully convinced that video or digital marketing in general had a good return on investment for them. So we had to go back and start with why video, then why next frontier video. We had to incorporate a lot of education into our sales process. Another example of a way that we adjusted to the Japanese market is that we create a lot of information to help companies explain our services or specific key messaging within their company because all decisions are made by consensus in Japan. So often there are five, six, seven different people or even different departments being consulted on whether to approve the project or not. This means that understanding the steps they need to follow to get the project green-lighted and creating custom documents and sometimes samples to help them get it approved is essential. These adjustments and many others have allowed us to continue to grow even during this crazy pandemic. Well, that's it for now. Thank you again for watching. Please don't forget to subscribe, and if you like the video, leave a thumbs up to keep those YouTube gods happy. And for any would-be entrepreneurs in Japan, please don't hesitate to leave questions in the comments section below I'd be happy to help you pursue your dreams the best I can. See you next week.